writing your own camera logic quickly becomes very complex as you want to add things like collision avoidance, specific ways of framing an actor in the scene, or really just following your player in a not robotic, smooth way. Cinemachine solves the vast majority of these problems that we run into when we're developing our game in abstract set away from our own code. Hey, Chris here from Lom Academy, here to help you. Who, me? Yes, you. Make your game dev dreams become a reality by allowing us to abstract away all this camera logic out of our code and use this powerful tool. Cinemachine aims to move all of this code about moving and managing our cameras out of our code and into these modules that it has. This allows us to focus on how does our camera feel, not how do we implement that feel. And sure, for many cases, we can just have very simple camera follows and it'll work for us. Even in my game, I launched using a very simple camera follow when I'm following the person from top down. I recently found that adding Cinemachine in here, while I could still do the same thing using Cinemachine, just removing that script out of my code, Cinemachine allowed me to offer a lot more of a smooth experience that made the game just feel a lot better. I've known Cinemachine existed for a long time and I just never got around to looking into it too much. So I finally decided, let's go ahead. This is the most powerful camera system I've ever seen. Let's take a look at it. After going through the docs, some tutorials, and implementing it myself, I really don't have any reason why you wouldn't use Cinemachine now in your game, and any reason why you would implement your own code to manage these cameras. To install it, you just search on the Unity registry, Cinemachine, click install, and you're ready to go. The key difference whenever we start using Cinemachine versus whatever system you're using before, is instead of having potentially multiple cameras that you need to position in different places and transition from one to the next, we're instead gonna start using virtual cameras. And these have three main functions. Number one is they will position a camera. Number two is they will rotate the camera. And finally, number three is they will apply some behaviors to that camera. By behaviors, I mean they can add noise to the camera, they can blend from one camera to the next camera or set up the configuration of how the blend goes really and handle the targeting. Once you've configured some virtual cameras, you can attach what's called the Cinemachine brain to your main camera. We're only gonna keep one camera in most cases. The Cinemachine brain detects which virtual cameras are available and decides based on the priority, which one should be displayed. As you maybe toggle on or off or some conditions change on those virtual cameras, it will decide whether it needs to cut or blend to a new virtual camera to give you a really smooth experience or potentially jagged experience if that's what you're looking for as we toggle between these different virtual cameras with different targets. Of course, because Cinemachine has a lot of power, you don't have to use all of it at once. You can stick with simple use cases. For example, in my game, I'm only using a single virtual camera at any point. So I have a single virtual camera, the Cinemachine brain, and that's it. For a lot of cases, that's probably all you're gonna use, but Cinemachine allows you to expand on this very easily using the same workflow. So that way you can add in things like cutscenes seamlessly into your game. Let's open up the Unity editor and start adding these components into our demo scene. In this scene, I just have a normal camera that's pointed at my player object. I only have a very simple click to move script in this project. We're gonna exclusively use Cinemachine to achieve the camera behaviors we're talking about today. As I was saying, you need to attach the Cinemachine brain to the main camera. I'm not gonna to touch any options here whatsoever today. Whatever gives us by default is what we're gonna use. Since we're gonna stick with a single virtual camera, a lot of these options also don't really apply. I'll then create a virtual camera game object and attach the Cinemachine virtual camera. You'll see as soon as that component gets added, the camera position has moved to wherever this position was. So as I was saying, the virtual camera controls the position and rotation of our camera for us. I'll quickly align it back to something reasonable. Cool, now we're looking at our player again. There are a lot of options here that can kind of be intimidating, but don't worry, it's not as complicated as it seems. And we're gonna really limit what we're gonna talk about today to keep it straightforward. We're only gonna talk about one tracking type with the body and one tracking type with the aim. Before we get to that though, there are some other options we need to consider. We need to first specify what is the object that we wanna look at and which object will we follow. In this video, we're gonna assign them to be the same thing, but potentially you could assign them to be different options. I've never come across that use case yet, but it's something that you can do. So I'll drag the capsule to both of these, the capsules of the player. Things like priority only come into play whenever we're talking about multiple virtual cameras, so those we can ignore. We have a lens vertical FOV set to 40, and it's extensible. So if we expand this, 
you'll see that we have basically all of the same options that we have for modifying the camera. The virtual camera just overrides these properties on the camera itself. This Dutch option also provides some rotation to our camera. I'll be leaving all of those alone today as well. Transitions as well only applies if we have multiple virtual cameras, so we can safely ignore that today. So really there's only two key configurations we're thinking about today, the body and the aim. The body controls how do we follow the target and the aim unsurprisingly controls how do we aim the camera at the target. Both of these operate on different options too. The body follows the follow, the aim looks at the look at. There are several options for how do we follow a target, most of which come with their own relatively complex possible configurations, and that's why today we're only going to take a look at the transposer, because this video would end up being hours long if I'm going into each option here on the Cinemachine virtual camera. So in total, we could do nothing, third person follow, framing transposer, hard lock to target, orbital transposer, track dolly, or transposer. So we're just going to use this last one, the transposer. I find that this one is quite good for at least the scenario we're talking about today, with this kind of top-down view that we're talking about. The transposer works quite well for things like MOBAs, RTS, or twin stick shooters. And in my own game, Llama Survival, this is what I have moved over to, is the exact configuration we're gonna take a look at today. Immediately, we can see that we have several options to choose from. From our binding modes, we have lock to target on assign, lock to target with world up, lock to target no roll, lock to target, world space, and simple follow with world up. Lock to target itself will try to maintain this follow distance, and as the object rotates, the camera will also rotate. Cinema Machine will try to keep the target in the field of view, rotating and following it as the object moves and rotates itself. You'll notice that this doesn't work particularly well right now because our aim is set to do nothing. So as the object rotates, the camera is also rotating and we can't see the player anymore. When I say the camera is rotated, I mean the camera is rotated around the target. That's why a lot of these also require that you have an aim setting. If I change the aim to hard look at, we'll get more of an experience that we would expect to get here. If we change it to lock to target on assign, then only as we assign the follow will the transposer start rotating. So it assigns the rotation of the camera only as soon as we assign the follow. This is quite convenient to get your camera looking in the right place and following at the right distance if you want the camera to keep the initial rotation of whenever you assign the follow. You will notice from the screenshots from Unity that you could end up with some strange behavior if you have some rotation that's assigned on start though. Lock to target no roll behaves the exact same as lock to target, except that it will not follow with the Z rotation. So if I start rotating the capsule on the Z axis, you'll see that the camera does not rotate. However, as I rotate the X and the Y, it will. Lock to target with world up behaves very similarly to lock to target with no roll, except it also ignores the X. So it will only rotate along the Y axis with our object. If we choose world space, the camera does not ever rotate. It only follows the target based on these offsets. If you want a fixed perspective camera, this is the one for you. Simple follow with world up. The explanation from Unity is a little bit weird. It says that this mode emulates the action a human camera operator would take while instructed to follow a target. I find that this is required that you also have the aim looking at the object as well because you can see sometimes the camera will not follow the target enough. It feels pretty nice, but without an aim, it doesn't work. It behaves similar to the world space, but tries to move less to maintain those offsets. I'm gonna set the blending mode back to world space and also play with a damping sum. Damping values basically give you a softer follow so the object can get farther away from the target follow offsets based on these values in each direction. It gives you basically a less responsive camera that depending on your values can feel nice and can also make it so that the camera moves less. Putting extremely high values here like 12 may be a little bit too soft. Generally I like to have the values in the single digit range. We'll talk about the damping more as we talk about the composer on the aim which we're going to start doing in just a second. Really quick, before we get to the next section, I wanna to talk to you about a really awesome deal going on over at HumbleBundle.com. Infinity PBR has teamed up with the one and only Jason Wyman with the Ultimate Unity Fantasy Game Development Bundle. This is a pay what you want bundle with up to 29 items that has a game development course from Jason, three parts there, and a bunch of the really high quality 3D models from Infinity PBR. It also has some sounds and a customization system in that bundle. If you've never seen any content from Infinity PBR, they have really high quality, awesome content. Let's talk about the dragon. This is my favorite one. So in this dragon, 
Normally, if you're going to buy a dragon, you'll just get the base model and maybe one or two different materials to kind of look a little bit different. This dragon has a ton of different options. You can also customize how the model looks with blend shapes. So that way you can really add a lot of different character and feel to that dragon. So you're not just stuck with that one base model. It also comes with a lot of different options on how does this dragon look in terms of materials. So it's a really highly customized one. On top of all of that, it also comes with a particle system for the fire that looks really nice and sounds. So you're really getting the complete package with just this one asset where you're getting the particle systems, different customization options, and audio. That's just one example of what they do most of the time. This is all of what comes with their 3D models. It's really a phenomenal deal. I've got an affiliate link down in the description. You can check it out if you're building a fantasy game at all. I would highly recommend you head over there, check out and see if this is gonna match into your game. If we add in the composer for the aim, we'll see that we still have a track object offset, much like we did on the body. So we can choose if we want this to follow the target or look at the target at a higher point or a lower point. For example, I can try to frame the feet of this capsule or the head. We have a large amount of options here. And to explain it, I think the best way to do is for me to lower the damping to zero. If we set the damping to zero and the look ahead time, look ahead smoothing all to zero, this is essentially the same as doing hard look at, where the camera will always try to keep whatever target that we have in the look at squarely center in the screen based on our track offset. The little yellow dot you see is the point that we're trying to keep in the center of the screen. If I increase the damping, you can see that this object is allowed to go farther away from the center of the screen, and eventually we will get it back into the center of the screen in about three seconds. If I reset those to zero, and we instead use the look ahead time, this projects based on the object's current velocity, where should the camera be looking? I've set the value to be one, and it's quite jittery. As the nav mesh agent starts moving, it very abruptly changes where we're looking, so that's why we have also the look ahead smoothing option. This helps smooth out the velocity, so we get a softer feel. We can also optionally ignore the Y value, so we'll keep it more centered in the screen. You'll see as the nav mesh agent goes up and down the stairs, he doesn't get as far off screen when we have look ahead ignore Y enabled. You can use this to combat that agent getting off screen if you have elevation in your game. If I disable it again, you'll see that the agent gets significantly more off screen. The next values we have are screen X and Y. Putting a value such as zero is fully left aligned and fully top aligned. Whatever values we have here are where we're going to try to position the object on the screen. If we move these closer to zero, that brings me to the top left of the screen. If we'd like them to be in the bottom right, we'll set them to be something like 0.8 and 0.9. That's quite far at the bottom right of the screen. Quite frequently, we'll want it to be relatively close to the center, so values closer to 0.5 are more reasonable. Next, we have the dead zone width and dead zone height, which control the area on the screen that an object is allowed to move before the composer starts trying to correct the value. If I do very small movements here, you'll see that there's no rotation happening. And because I've turned the damping down so much, the composer is basically not doing anything here. This is virtually the same as not having the aim. If I greatly increase the damping, you'll see that it does start doing some rotation for us. This is useful to help ignore some really small movements that the camera shouldn't necessarily respond to. These units are also defined in percentages of the screen. So a value of one is the full screen, a value of zero is 0% zero of the screen. Next, we have the soft zone. This is basically the area on the screen that we are allowing the camera to be soft on. As soon as we enter into that pink area, that's more the hard area where the camera will be more forceful in asserting that the camera is keeping this object in this space. If we make this soft zone very small, for example, these are also, by the way, in percentages of the screen units. It's also important to note that the dead zone must be less than or equal to the soft zone. So if we set this dead zone height to be higher than 0.8, the soft zone height will automatically adjust to be the same value. So we turn the soft zone very low and increase the damping or the look ahead time by a very large amount. You'll see that the camera is significantly less slow in following the player. Let's run that again with the soft zone back to where it was before. You'll see that the object can get significantly farther out of camera with these high smoothing and look ahead time values than whenever we have a very small soft zone region. 
I want to give a huge shout out to all of my Patreon supporters. Every one of you is helping this channel grow, reach more people, and add value to more people. And that means more people are making their game development dreams become a reality. If you want to show your support, you can go to patreon.com slash Academy, get your name up here on the screen, and get a voice shout out starting at the awesome tier. At the phenomenal tier level, there's Andrew Bowen. And at the awesome tier, there's Gerald Anderson, Autumn K, Matt Parkin, Ivan, Paul Berry, and Rulin. Thank you all for your support. I am so grateful. All of these configurations on the composer are really about making the camera rotation feel more natural by smoothing out that movement. This is generally well received because it feels more natural than the kind of hard robotic movements I would get whenever we're using, for example, the hard look at and always looking at the target whenever there's something that happens. Having these smoothed out transitions just feels better in most cases. The hard rotations or linear interpolations that we might initially use ourselves whenever we create our own camera system, our players can just tell that these were quickly thrown together and were relatively low effort, and that reflects poorly on our games. Sin Machine gives us that high effort feel without actually having to implement a high effort script. Sure, we can spend a lot of high effort on tweaking the configurations, but at least we don't have to spend a high effort on tweaking configurations and implementing that behavior. Remember, this is only a single configuration for the body and aim. There are several more, six, something like that for each. But there's a lot more that we can do with Sin Machine. I'll include a link to the docs if you want to take a look at some of those other options. And probably in the future, I'll also cover some more of those in different videos. At the very least, what I hope this video did was kind of opened you up to the option of using Cinema Machine, maybe assuage some fears that you had about using it. If you got value out of this video, please consider liking and subscribing to help the channel grow, reach more people, and add value to more people. This new video is posted every Tutorial Tuesday, and I'll see you next week.